Now, I want to introduce you to our first speaker, our first presenter, who is Mark Millis. And he's one of the leading international authorities on how to search for revolutionary space flight. He has been head of the NASA uh, Propulsion Breakthrough Laboratories. He also started uh, one of the first interstellar organizations called Tau Zero that starts to look for these ideas about how do we move forward with interstellar flight. And so I'd ask for Mark Millis to actually talk to us about challenges of interstellar flight. Thank you. Um, first thing I'd like to point out is that um, we're actually on a spaceship right now, and um, the major material uh, construct is dirt and rocks, and some molten stuff in the core. Um, for holding in our atmosphere, we're just using gravity. Uh, for our shields, we have magnetic fields, and hopefully they won't change over time. Um, but that's all of humanity is there. And uh, if anything happens to this place, if we want to extend beyond, uh, that's kind of the big deal of why we're doing this, the ultimate benefit, so that we can survive beyond the fate of Earth. But also, I mean, if we make that leap, we've also now just, it's not about survival, it's about thriving with so many more opportunities uh, that we can do. But also, it's not just about those ultimate benefits, it's what do we learn along the way. And one that I hope will come out of this is that if we're busy conquering these frontiers, we'll be less likely to worry about conquering each other. And... Um, the other one that really evokes where I come from on this is looking for revolutionary progress rather than just the extensions of what we already know how to do. Going to Moon and Mars are extensions of what we pretty much know how to do, but to go to the stars, it's going to be a completely different thing. And then the, um, the other interesting thing that I like is it starts to give us a crucible around which we can think about human life and sustainability, both uh, environmentally and um, culturally. I'm going to start with uh, <clears throat> a few things that you probably don't know. And the first one is that light speed is really slow. For us, it seems instantaneous, but on the scale of the galaxy, it's quite slow. Uh, the other one, when you see science fiction things and they show rocket ships going to the stars, mm, no. Um, rockets, they're good for interplanetary uh, kind of things, but when you really talk about uh, starflight, you're into a different regime. And talking about it, different regime, the amount of energy it will take to do an interstellar mission brings us to the level where we have so much energy at our disposal that if we misuse it, we could destroy the Earth. So getting to the point of a society where we can do this, we're going to have to learn how to live with each other peacefully to make sure that uh, our growing prowess uh, isn't used to destroy ourselves. Uh, the other thing that uh, we tend to forget when we get compartmentalized thinking is that there are other things that are going to affect how this actually pans out. Um, one, transhumanism, which is the idea of humans eventually merging more with machinery. Uh, I have hearing aids, even though they're worn, not implanted. Um, things like that. Um, so what will humanity be like when they go to the stars? Also, the um, artificial intelligence uh, about mid this century is supposed to become uh, better than the human brain. Will that help us accelerate our developments uh, on this or, as other people predict, something else? Now, when trying to predict when, how long before we can do interstellar flight, there's been a few different things. And the short answer is, well, maybe about two centuries. Um, and to convey that chart that's up there, that gray area, is the uncertainty band, meaning that you know this answer is an estimate. And uh, the green area there just kind of reflects roughly the uh, uncertainty of when might we be able to do that first mission. But right now, it's coming in around uh, two centuries from now. And this particular one is based about how much energy does humanity have, how much do we vote to space missions, and how much energy would it take. Now, to also kind of give you a rough idea of the scale of the problem, because this is really hard to convey in terms of what we're familiar with, because these are quite far than other uh, pedestrian, pedestrian distances. Our nearest star is a little over four light years away, and that means at light speed, it's going to take you more than four years to get to it. So think about that's like getting a college degree. Um, the nearest habitable planet might be on the order. Now, these are rough estimates of 20 light years away, again, 20 years at light speed. 
Uh, other potential civilizations, and this is really rough estimates, but it might be 500 to 200 light years away before we reach that. And to go from the, uh, to the center of our galaxy or to the outer edge is 25,000 light years. And the diameter of the universe is about 100,000 light years. So let me put this into the context that if our cavemen had a really bright beacon and could send out a light signal, um, it might now be getting to the other side of the uh, galaxy. So this is a way different uh, scale of things. Now, when talking about revolutionary progress, there's either two ways of thinking about it. Extending technology to scales that we've never seen them before, where we have to have large infrastructure in space to provide extra energy for space sails or to mine helium-3 from, uh, from Uranus, um, and then also a completely sustainable life support is another one. The other way of approaching the space flight is to look for uh, future physics. Um, look at the ideas of faster than light, uh, rocketless space drives, and the things like that. And the last one to bring up that will come into later sessions is that I think is fun, is when you think about sending out segments of humanity in, in world ships, um, that kind of context is easier to talk about in a dispassionate, um, more analytical way to decide well, how do we do sustainable life support, meaning of life for that crew, governance models and things like that, as opposed to when we have those arguments here on Earth, especially governance models and culture, we kind of do it by war, which isn't all that constructive. Um, so this idea of sending humans out gives us a way to actually examine our own lives and what would it mean to keep ourselves meaningful lives indefinitely. That's it. Thank you. Okay.